So we're back in the studio and Beatrice really clearly explained how these large langu language models work, but also the history of it. I really enjoyed it. What did you think of it, uh, Willem? Excellent overview. Yeah. There's so much literature about large language models that it's almost impossible to keep up. So this is one of the, the greatest resources so far that I've seen. Yeah I, yeah, I really think it's very clear. And also David did a great job by doing the more high level overview and she really did a deep dive into it. Really, really, really great. Yeah. So thank you so much for joining us here. Thanks. Can you please introduce yourself for a bit? Yeah, so I'm Willem Meins. Uh, I work as a chief AI architect for an uh, agency, uh, part of InfoSupport, uh, a company that I've been working for for 16 years now. Oh. Uh, I've been in the AI field <laughs> for 11 years. Uh, actually, one of the people that uh, started with the global AI community. Um, yeah, I've been enjoying the ride so far. Uh, since uh, October last year, it's been super crazy with large language models. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you also worked in the... Uh, you you also got that history into your daily work as well with all those different language models that be just uh, explained to us. You work with them as well or not? Yeah, yeah I've worked with the smaller ones first yeah. and uh, uh, the last two months I believe uh, we've started experimenting with the really large models, uh, GPT-4 even, uh, mm -hmm. although very short so it's, it's still a work in progress in that yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah. And what are you specifically excited about in the AI field and what to come? Ooh, yeah, so uh, generative AI is, is one of those things that not a lot of people understand yet what you can do with it. Uh, and that, that's, that's exciting, I think. Uh, lots of people are learning about it. Um, but the other thing that I find very exciting is, is productionalizing this sort of stuff in production. Um, so MLOps is one of the key things that I work on. Mm -hmm. um, and combining that with large language models, for example, is, is super exciting to work on. Nice, yeah. nice. So you're going to give a session. What yep. is that about? So I spent uh, a couple of months working on uh, a prototype for a chatbot uh, using internal data from info support in uh, an agency. Um, I brought along a few snippets of code that I have. And one of the tools that I've been using is Microsoft Semantic Kernel. Mm -hmm. So uh, normal people in data science, well, normal, I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> uh, data scientists often use Python these days. Um, semantic kernel is in C-sharp, so it will be all in C-sharp today. Uh, and that's on purpose because I thought, well, if I can open up the world of large language models to C-sharp developers, there's a lot more people there that can make use of this, uh, this sort of application. Yeah. And hopefully they will join in on the AI fun and eventually uh, gateway over to Python. I don't know what happens, but uh, it's a lot of fun uh, so far. Or stay with C-sharp. Yeah. yeah, that could happen too. Yeah, yeah there's yeah. a lot of uh, machine learning happening in C-sharp as well these days. So. Yeah. So are you ready then? I'm ready. Okay, let's go. Let's take a look. <laughs> cool. So yeah. Um, We have to wait for a bit. <laughs> Some technical issues, small technical issues. Yes. Cool. So yeah, I brought along um, uh, some stuff that I've been working on. It's very, very, very prototypical, if you will. Um, uh, th that's all the stuff that's happening in large language models. So uh, bear with me today uh, as I show off some uh, stuff that I've been working on. Um, so yeah, the goal for me is to show you in 30 minutes approximately how you can use large language models from C Sharp um, to enhance the functionality of your application. So large language models on themselves, like ChatGPT, are very useful, I think. But you can do a lot more once you start integrating large language models in your own application. So roughly, uh, what are we talking about today? Uh, let me first introduce Semantic Kernel to you. Uh, explain how uh, how it came to be. What is it exactly? Um, then we'll write some C sharp code uh, just to get give you a feel of what you can do with C sharp in a large language model and what options there are. Uh, there's a lot of stuff uh, to cover here. I'm not going to cover the full feature set of uh, Semantic Kernel, just the basics today. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to show to you is 
how can I use internal information from my organization with a large language model to give grounded responses? Uh, that's the stuff that they just covered in the preview sessions about uh, the fact that large language models sometimes give you an answer that might not be actually true. Uh, and grounding uh, the answers with um, information uh, from a search index or, or some other location, that, that's very useful. And I'm going to show you how to, you can use cognitive search uh, in this case. And then finally, uh, I ran into a lot of challenges, a lot of things that, that don't work yet, uh, as you might expect. Uh, that's all fine. I'm, I have a few tips and tricks if we have time at the end um, to explain some of the challenges that you might run into and how to fix those. So I got interested into uh, Microsoft Semantic Kernel and building on top of large language models from chat.openai.com, one of the, the most iconic samples of using ChatGPT in the world. Uh, I think many who are watching today have used chat.openai.com. Um, but actually, if you look at the application, there's a lot more to it than just using the model, despite what you might, might think at first. Um, so yeah, I made a, I try to, reverse engineer the architecture of what they made. And um, this is sort of the picture that I drew in my mind. Um, so there's you, the user at the top, using chat.openai.com. Uh, you need a front end for the model to work with. And then you need some sort of application logic um, to control basically how input is handled, how output is generated back to the user. Um, and that's the, the kernel, if you will, of the chatbot. Um, let's put it that way. And behind this API, there's the model in orange in this case. And the model, all it does is generate the tokens based on input you provided to the bot. And um, I, will, I will show you in a minute how that works uh, roughly. Um, and then of course, there's a lot of other stuff. I'm not going to cover that, but imagine that, that AI in this case is not just the model. AI is actually part of a larger application. And this is what you will see in many, many cases where we are using AI today. And I think this will get even more important towards the future as we build more AI applications uh, based on Python or C Sharp or another language. Um, so, yeah, talking about this kernel component, um, at the center of the application, there's sort of a, a key component that controls how the AI model is applied to language. Um, of course, on the left, it starts with a, with a prompt. That's my message that I'm sending to the chatbot. Uh, it goes through the user interface to my API, and then it ends up in the kernel. And uh, the kernel has a context that, that basically provides information. What should I do with this input? And this is what Microsoft Semantic Kernel implements for you. Microsoft Semantic Kernel implements the key component that you need for building large language model-based applications. And the way it works in the Microsoft Semantic Kernel is that there's a context and this context contains variables, the input from you, but also other information that you might need, like the name of the user, uh, the location where the user is, uh, uh, is staying at, um, business information that you might need, maybe search documents. There's a lot of stuff you can include into your language application and feed to uh, a language model. Um, and the way you use a language model in this case is by building a skill. Uh, and the skill is, a, is made out of, out of a prompt template, uh, some configuration, and then a piece of code that you write. Uh, that's, that's basically the core. And I'm, I'm going to show you in a minute how that works exactly. But you can do a lot more because you can say, well, process my prompt and split it up into steps, for example. And then you can use something like, uh, called a planner and you can build plans based on language input that you provide. I'm not covering it today, but it's worthwhile uh, to check out the documentation and learn about using a planner because that, that makes it really powerful. Um, and you can use this to build agents, uh, semi-autonomous agents. Uh, the other important part here is, is the memory. Um, so if you're, if you're using chat.openai.com, you don't have something called an internal memory. So business documentation is not included because it's not connected to your internal search index. It's not connected to SharePoint or other applications. If you want to use that, that's not possible through the public services at, the po at this point. What you need to do is you need to build your own chatbot. Um, there's several options, but Semantic Kernel allows you to do this in C Sharp. 
and it allows you to connect a search index of some sort to the kernel um, to integrate search results into the chat conversation that you have. And I'm, I'm talking about chat at the moment, but um, since it's a large language model application, you can also use this for completions and other stuff. So, uh, for example, you can categorize information, uh, bank transactions based on a description. Uh, you can use it to generate project roles for a project proposal uh, and, and lots more stuff besides using it for chat. So that's enough talk about uh, what it actually is. Let's take a look at some code and how to set up an application with it. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm building an application in C-sharp. It's a console application, so very, very basic today. Um, but you can integrate the same code into Microsoft Bot Framework or ASP.NET Core or Microsoft Teams, for that matter, that works too. Um, I, I use this sample to keep it very basic so you, you get the, the core of things, the kernel, if you will. So the way it works is that um, right now in my uh, C-sharp application, I've added one important package uh, to the set, and that's the Microsoft.Semantic kernel package. And the Microsoft.Semantic kernel package is currently in, in preview, so you have to set the, the checkbox to include a pre-release. Uh, it changes several times per week at the moment, so it's moving very fast. Um, so I recommend updating regularly because they are fixing stuff uh, uh, fast as well. Uh, this contains the core of what you need to build a language model application. And there are several add-ons based on, on, on the things that you can do, uh, like custom planners, custom skills, connections to other services, so like Cognitive Search, Microsoft Graph API, for example, can also be used. Um, that you can add to this collection of, of packages. And the idea is if you start building an application, um, you first have to build a kernel. And the way this works is by importing the um, Microsoft.Semantic kernel namespace, you get access to the, the key component of Microsoft Semantic kernel. And to build a kernel, yeah, a very basic one would be kernel.builder and then calling calling build. That will give you an empty kernel. But of course, we're building a language application, so I need to add a language model to it. In my example, I'm using Microsoft Azure OpenAI service um, that I've deployed in my subscription. And the way I access it is by giving it a name for my model that I've deployed inside by Microsoft Azure OpenAI, uh, an endpoint, and a key, an API key. And that's how I hook up the language model to the kernel. And the way this looks in, uh, in Azure is um, when I go to my Azure portal, I can open up the Azure OpenAI uh, environment from the, from the Azure portal. And what's important to keep in mind here is that um, here on the left, I've got several deployments in a collection and the top one, the Da Vinci one, is the one that I'm using. So you can create a, de a deployment for a model by selecting one from the drop-down. There's, there's a load of models that you can choose from, giving it a name, and then making it available to uh, the users of my uh, application. A good thing to keep in mind here is that um, you can have one deployment per model. So if you're thinking, oh, I have a, a Da Vinci Text uh, 3, deploy for one project and I'm going to deploy for a second time for another project, that doesn't work. You can only use one, but you can use multiple Azure OpenAI instances uh, for different projects. And it only matters for billing. It's not like you have a lot of options you can set at the moment. So um, it's pretty limited in that sense. Okay, so I've got this hooked up. What I then need to do is I need to tell it where to find skills. I just covered skills in, a, in, a, in my slides. Uh, a skill is um, a specific task that you ask from the model. And it's, it's not that complicated, actually. Um, basically, what you do is you create a directory in your project um, with the name of the collection of skills that you want to use. And then you create a folder underneath that uh, with the name of the skill. And just give it a descriptive name. It's something that you use from your code. That's the idea here. And what I need to do is I need to provide two files for it. 
the first file is my configuration file, and this controls the hyperparameters for the generation step of the model. Uh, in this case, I'm asking it for a completion. I added a subscription that's for debugging for myself. And then I said uh, to Azure OpenAI, um, I have a completion skill and I want a max 150 tokens back from, from the model. And the temperature is 0 0.7, which temperature controls how creative, creative it is. So it controls the sampling of the output. Um, as you might remember from the previous session, um, GPT generates a probability distribution and we sample from this probability distribution the next token. And the temperature controls this sampling mechanism, the same as top P, presence and frequency penalty. Uh, those control how the output is sampled. So you might get more or less accurate responses based on these settings. So you might want to experiment. The other part of the skill is the prompt template. And the prompt template is actually a predefined piece of text that you write um, that gets filled in with variables from uh, that contain the input from the application. So this is where you can control what the model is generating. In my case, I'm asking it, please explain what the following text is about. And then between curly braces and the dollar sign, I'm saying, put the input right here in the prompt. And at the end, I'm saying summary colon, and that will generate the summary. I'm using summary colon on purpose here, because if I don't do that, the model will start chatting with me. It will start telling me, sure, I can summarize the text and I can, uh, this is about blah, 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 a whole, uh, a whole lot of text. Uh, in summary, this is a summary of the text. And that's a long story. I don't want that. I want it to be punctual. So I'm saying summary colon, please give me the summary and then stop talking to me. Uh, that's about it. And the way I can use this skill for my application is I need to give it a path where my skills are stored. And then what I can say is kernel.import semantic skill from a directory. Um, and this directory is summarization. And that will give me the summary summarized text skill. And the summarized text skill, uh, in this case, I can call with a uh, set of context variables right here at the bottom of my code. And in the context, I'm putting input. Remember from my prompt text uh, that I have here, there's a variable called input. So that gets filled up. And then what I do is I call run async on the kernel and I will use my skill with the context information that I provided and that will generate the results. So what I can do is I can run this on my computer and I will start talking to ChatGPT or rather the text completion model in this case and I will start getting a, a response. And my input text was about semantic kernel and I asked it, can you explain a little bit what semantic kernel is based on the text that I've uh, provided. And it will generate response. As you might have noticed, it takes a little bit of time. Uh, GPT models are not very fast. So this is also uh, a tip already. Make sure that you provide a proper progress indication so users know that you're busy. Otherwise, uh, yeah, they will get lost because it, it takes a lot of time to generate a response. So that, that's the basic uh, the basics of, of building a language model application. From here, it's all about creati creativity, building the right prompt, and all about controlling the temperature. But what if you have a more complex scenario? Well, what you could do, for example, is if you have a very large piece of text and you need to categorize it, it might not categorize it immediately in the correct direction. What you can do is then say to Semantic Kernel, hey, I want to summarize the text first, and then I want to categorize it. And the way you do this is by saying, okay, I've got this, this text here, run async. I have my input variables. I have my skill. I can chain a second skill and I can say categorize. And this way, the input from one skill gets summarized and then sent off as input for the second skill. So you can build chains of skills if you want to. Uh, and this way you can, you can build some pretty complicated pieces of, of tech um, in your application that allow for you to solve very complex uh, scenarios. So that's um, yeah, the basics of Microsoft uh, Semantic Kernel. Uh, it's changing all the time, so my demo might be different tomorrow, but please give it a try. I will put it up on, uh, on GitHub. 
uh, for people to take a look at. So there's one more piece that uh, I wanted to show to you. Um, and that's actually, I think, one of the superpowers of Microsoft Semantic Kernel. And that's memory. Um, we talked about this uh, earlier in the session. You can, so you can build a semantic kernel uh, skill to uh, process text into a summary or categorize it, or even for chat if you want to. Uh, but that doesn't give you access to internal documentation from your organization. And this is where memory comes into play. What you can do is you can provide a memory to Microsoft Semantic Kernel, and it will connect your business documents to your conversation that you have with, uh, with the bot. And the way to do this is by using, uh, for example, Azure Cognitive Services. So the way this works is first we take, we take the original prompt that we had before in the previous demo, and we send it to the kernel we call run async. And what will happen is, uh, instead of going to a skill directly, it will take the memory into account and it will perform a search against cognitive search. And the output from the search gets included into uh, your application. And um, once that's included in your, in your context, you can send off the prompt template to Azure OpenAI with your search results included in that. And it will give you a much more grounded response in your application. Um, so I can very quickly show that. I don't have running code for this uh, right now, um, but there's a lot of samples on GitHub you can try. Um, the way you, you include memory in Azure Cognitive Search is by going back to this kernel.builder statement at the top of my code. And I can say uh, with memory, new cognitive search memory. And I can give it an endpoint. and an API key, and it will connect up to my Azure Cognitive Search. And it gets included automatically, the memory, in my application. And of course, now you have to spend time dealing with search as well, on top of, of just writing a creative prompt and making sure that that works. Um, but I can assure you it's worth, uh, really worth your time uh, trying this out. Uh, I've had a great success finding information uh, about myself uh, in documents uh, internally. So uh, it's a very useful skill, I think. So, so far I've been trying this for uh, a couple of months, one and a half, two months approximately. And um, yeah, I've run into a number of, of challenges that um, uh, I think are worth covering here. So one of the things that I ran into is that designing a good, pro a good prompt is a very creative process. You, funny enough, you can't ask an AI for a good prompt. It won't do that. Uh, you will have to write that yourself. And the first prompt will definitely not be the best prompt that, that you can think of. So uh, the way I deal with it uh, in my daily work is well, we start with a simple prompt at work and um, we log the, the user response based on the prompt. Um, we have a thumbs up, thumbs down button in the user interface. If a, if a person presses the thumbs up button, we know this is a good prompt. If, if the person presses the thumbs down button, it's a bad prompt. Um, and we look at the input that the user gave compared to the prompt and try to figure out a better way of doing things. Um, um, this is the way it works in Semantic Kernel. There are other options like uh, Microsoft Prompt Flow that's uh, just in preview, and you can use that as well. Um, if you have access at this point. Um, they provide a lot of more options to deal with it. Um, but if, if you're up for a challenge and if you're into software engineering, I can highly recommend trying out A-B testing for prompts and tracking the results in Azure Machine Learning uh, Service, for example, just to get a better idea of how well we're doing. And the other thing that uh, caused a lot of... Uh, uh, issues, uh, so to speak, is that, so I showed uh, using chains of, of prompts uh, and skills. And one of the things is that uh, people often forget about is that if you have a chain of skills that generates multiple requests to Microsoft OpenAI service and you're paying for all the tokens that you use. So be careful, if you have a lot of skills in a chain, you might want to think about combining those skills into one writing a better prompt instead of chaining prompts together. 
Um, again, this is an iterative approach, so I don't know the, the, the full answer yet, how to do it. Um, but yeah, it's worth spending a bit of time thinking about costs and how to optimize your prompts. The other thing is that, so you have the option of using a planner and a planner allows you to combine API calls with large language model calls with um, uh, API calls, uh, database calls. Um, one of the things that happened to me is that my planner was running in a circle and it was calling the language model over and over again for 15 minutes. And we were thinking, oh, he's doing a great job, but he's not doing a great job. He's spending all the money on your credit card. So be careful. Uh, this is not something you get protected against. You have to build your own code to protect your, um, your application against such things. And finally, yeah, this has been covered today many times. Safety is a concern uh, still. Um, I know that Azure OpenAI service has protections against uh, bad language uh, and certain topics uh, because they have uh, a content moderation in front of it. But still, some, sometimes it just breaks. Um, it's probability based, so we don't know what will happen. Uh, I would like, I would certainly recommend uh, putting in place the, the necessary logging and monitoring stuff. And um, I would spend a lot of time actually testing the prompts in bulk just to make sure that you have uh, the right prompt in place and, and all the safeguards are working as expected. Um, yeah, let's be honest, the problems that we had with uh, a Bing bot that's generating a very evil response that can happen to you too because there's no protection and you have to build that yourself. Um, and that's it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this and if you have any questions, um, I'm still here so uh, you can ask them uh, uh, during the interview. Well, well um, thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. For me it was uh, quite new, I had not made use of semantic kernel yet, but uh, I think with these tips and tricks for sure I'm going to give it a try. Well, with that we're going to our next guest. Hi Alessandro. Hi. Have you made use of semantic kernel already? Uh, not yet, but tomorrow I will use it. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea. Please introduce yourself, Alessandro. Who are you? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Alessandro Pagliero. I'm a senior machine learning engineer working at uh, ThoughtWorks in the Amsterdam office. I have a background in experimental physics, and today I will uh, talk to you about how to use generative models to augment uh, AI uh, product development. And uh, it's a um, uh, uh, slightly different uh, from uh, what we've been talking about uh, so far because uh, at the time we worked on this project uh, there were no like large language models so we have used uh, other types of uh, models. So how long have you been working with generative AI then already? Um, a couple of years uh, okay. so far. Before the big hype? Yes, uh, before it was cool. <laughs> <laughs> well I'm looking forward to, to learn more about how you use generative AI without LLMs. Thanks.
Hello everyone, I'm Alessandro.